This case is breaking news, yet it hasn't been spread through the media much at all. A little girl was abducted by her mother and two months later, no one knows where she is gone. The last sighting of this two-year-old was allegedly by neighbors who claimed that her mother was carrying what appeared to be a child wrapped in a blanket, though the child was making no sound, nor was the child moving. Where is Oakley Snow and what happened to her? You are such a genuine gem. Thank you for clicking on this video. I'm Brooke McKenna, and this case is such an important one because this child is still missing. This is something that we really need to be aware of. If you know something, if you've seen something, if you've heard something, because at this point, no one is talking. But before we get into this case, I wanted to share some really exciting news because the true crime stories we cover are being told to a broader audience now on Roku TV. I have a brand new TV show called Motos and Malice with Brooke McKenna on Roku Live. So if you want to watch, you'll either need a Roku TV or a Roku stick, or you can go to the Roku channel.com and you can go to the Mysteria channel, which is 548 to be able to watch all of your favorite, most respectable true crime creators and their own shows. I'm so honored to be among such amazing creators who really have worked to get the victims' voices known, and I'm just thrilled to be able to share these cases further with a wider audience, and you'll never run out of true crime to watch with the endless marathon that is mysterious. So make sure you check it out, and thank you guys for making this possible. For this to happen without your support, I would have never been chosen to be one of these creators. So thank you endlessly. Now let's get back to the story. So it was January 19th of 2023 and two children would be abducted from their father Zachary's home in Cromwell, Oklahoma. Now this was two-year-old Oakley and her seven-month-old brother Colton and their father had called the police to report that their mother who was 22-year-old Madison Marshall had taken the children. Now Zachary said this was without his approval at all and he believed that the kids as well as Madison and her 25-year-old boyfriend Roan Waters were actually headed to Indiana where Roan had some family there and that possibly that is where they were taking the children but he could not get in contact with their mother. Now unfortunately in Oklahoma the custody does go to the mother automatically if the parents were not married at the time of having the children which Zachary and Madison were not and so technically this was not a crime to have her children to take her children and the the problem was that Zachary had no idea where his kids were. He had no idea if they were safe. And so that is why Oakley and Colton were put into the National Crime Information Center database at this point. Now, a family friend said that Oakley was a very happy baby with the biggest eyes and the best smile. I couldn't find much about Colton. I mean, he was just seven months old at that time, really just being that cute little baby who needed all the love and support in the world. And nobody knew if either of these children were getting that. And it turned out that they weren't because almost a month later in Indianapolis, a phone call would be made to Child Protective Services. Now, there was a woman on the line who was worried about the treatment of a few children by their parents. Now, before anything could be prevented by these social workers, which really social workers and CPS aren't always the best option, but before anything could be checked out, investigated, one of those children would vanish, but not just with their mother this time. You see, Oakley Mae Snow had been taken from her father, from her loving father, due to her mother allegedly wanting custody of her children. However, Oakley had vanished while under her care and nobody knew where she was. Now, the father, Zachary, was correct in his assumption that they had all gone to Indiana because Roan's mother actually lived in Indianapolis. And so Madison, Roan, Oakley, and Colton drove to his mother's home and his mother allegedly allowed them to stay there, would buy them food, would buy the kids food. But Roan's sister would come over often and she was the one who would eventually call CPS. You see, she would tell police who began investigating into this that when they first arrived, Arrived, she was very worried because she saw bruises on Oakley and she mentioned something and at that point that got her kicked out of the home. 
On February 9th, almost a month since these kids had been abducted, their father, Zachary, had no idea that his son was being left with a complete stranger. You see, that day, Rowan's mother had gotten a call from this random stranger. Well, it said she got a call from the stranger, but I'm assuming the stranger called the police or called CPS, who then called Rowan's mother. Either way, there was a man named Chad who had called to inform the family that Colton, the seven-month-old, had been left in his care and the parents were gone. Rowan's mother rushed over to this home to pick up Colton, and then she ended up giving Colton to Rowan's sister while she, you know, went out and tried to understand what happened to Rowan and to Madison, where they had gone. And this was the same sister who had questioned them about Oakley's injuries and was already very worried about these children. When they ended up calling Madison and Rowan and asking them why they left Colton alone, where in the world were they, Rowan said that, Oakley had actually hurt her head while bouncing on a ball and they needed to get her emergency care. So they immediately rushed over, leaving Colton there, who knows why, and were wanting to help Oakley. Now, Roan's sister said that she stayed at the home, at her mother's home, where Madison and Roan were staying when she was watching Colton. She was waiting for Madison, Roan, and Oakley to return home. However, when they returned home, Oakley was no longer with them. And at this point, Roan's sister didn't want to get into another argument. So she decided not to say anything. And instead, she headed home and reported her own brother and his girlfriend to CPS. Now, while investigating this entire story and where Oakley had gone, witnesses from around that home where this Chad lived, where Colton had been left, they would say that they had seen Madison and Roan and Oakley leaving the residence that day. That Madison was carrying what appeared to be a child wrapped in a blanket and that this child was not crying, it was not moving, and it was possibly unconscious. These witnesses were describing this home as a trap house or even a crack house. It was known to be a place where many people went and did drugs. And after talking with the family members of Madison and Roan and, and what they had told them about that day, investigators found that they said they were taking Oakley to a hospital, but the family had found no record of any hospital having seen her or had been called about her and she definitely was not still there. And that same day, Zachary filed a missing persons report from his daughter once again and Colton was actually found safe, of course, because he had been taken from his home, been taken care of by the sister and he was reunited with his birth father around this time but they still had no idea what happened to Oakley. It was also unknown where Madison and Roan had gone as this investigation began. They weren't really being talked to because they couldn't be located. Also around this time, family members of Madison and Roan were actually posting to Facebook. In fact, Oakley's great-grandmother was posting that Roan had actually injured Oakley and shared a picture of him, hoping that somebody would be able to locate him. And Zachary's family was trying to share information and get it out there, get the missing persons poster out there. And so everybody was really trying their best to get information out when the media wasn't necessarily picking this up. It would be almost another month of having no idea what happened to Oakley or to Madison or Roan, but on March 3rd in Colorado, police would actually be called to a hotel there. They had gotten a complaint at a Best Western, and the Greenwood Village police were called to the scene, and they arrived to find Roan Waters. Now, they found that this wasn't just a man that was being called at the hotel. He also had an outstanding warrant for his arrest back in Oklahoma where the children had first been abducted from their father. And they immediately brought him in for questioning because of this. Rowan would tell the police his statement, and he would say that he and Madison had taken the kids from their father and driven in his blue Dodge Durango, and they proceeded to travel to this trap house in Indianapolis to do some drugs while having the kids, and this would be the same house that Colton would be left at. He said that he and Madison then left for Colorado and they didn't have the kids. Because when he was asked about Oakley, he appeared to be unwilling or unable to cooperate and would not say anything. It turned out that Madison had been seen at the Best Western with Roan, but at the time the police arrived, she was not there and nor did 
the hotel room show any signs that children were there either. Now, Rome was being monitored when he would do his jailhouse phone calls because he wasn't giving much information on the missing child. And so he would call his mother and this was a few times and they were recorded and he would end up saying that he and Madison ended up dropping Oakley off somewhere, but that's all of the information he would reveal even to his mother. Rome was booked at the Arapaho Detention Center and this was with a $10,000 bond for a felony charge for being a fugitive of justice. But this outstanding warrant that Roan had from back in Oklahoma was not about the kidnapping at all. It was a completely separate charge that happened before. This was a charge of child abuse, domestic assault, and battery in the presence of a minor. This had allegedly happened on November 7th of 2022, the year prior, but it was actually only three months before the children were abducted from their father. And police alleged that Roan had struck Oakley in the face, causing her to have bruises and a swollen lip. On October 26th of 2022, a welfare check was actually done of Madison and her children. Madison's mother, Sheila, had wanted to make sure that they were all okay, and it sent the police over there. When police knocked on the door, Roan actually opened the door, saw it was police, and then slammed the door in their faces and told them to go away. The officer began saying, you know, we're just trying to do a welfare check. That's all we need to do here. And Roan basically opened the door to say to get off his property and that everything was fine. He said that only he and his mother lived there and nobody else. When officers were about to leave, headed back to their car, Roan ended up pulling out his cell phone and recording them, saying that they were illegally trespassing on his property and making this a huge event. Now, while they were headed back to their patrol car, Madison actually pulled up in a car with a woman, a friend of hers named Michelle Wegner, and all of the children were also inside. Now, Michelle was talking to the officers until Roan ran up and told her that she did not have to and that she shouldn't talk to them. Michelle was telling Roan they're just here to help and that she was going to talk to them. But Michelle basically turned to police and asked them, can I try to get Roan inside so we can have a civil conversation? And so Michelle and Madison tried to push him back in the home to get him away from the situation and he refused. It turned out that the Michelle talking to the police was the owner of the property and Madison and Roan and the kids were staying there at that time. Roan was best friends with Michelle's son and so that's how they came to know Michelle and about this property. But when things settled down and Madison talked to the police, she said that she and the kids were fine, that they weren't in any danger, and the police didn't see any injuries on anyone at that time. So they believed they had no reason to push the issue further and they ended up leaving. But these same officers would end up getting a call from their father, Zachary, who basically wanted help because he said he was going to pick up Madison and the kids at a location because Madison had asked him to and that he was scared that Rome was going to show up and do something, so he wanted some backup. Now remember, this was all before the abduction ever happened where they took the kids from Oklahoma to Indianapolis. This happened months prior. So police ended up going to Zachary's home and found Madison and the kids. And Madison would admit to them at that point that the day that they had gone for the welfare check, Roan had actually hit her two-year-old daughter, Oakley, in the face. She said that this was with an open hand because she wouldn't stop crying. Madison then showed the officers the cut on the inside of Oakley's mouth and on her upper lip and Madison claimed that she told Roan that he was not allowed to touch her child, and then he slapped her and left injuries to her eyelid. At that point, pictures were taken of the injuries. A statement was made by Madison. However, she did not want to press charges, at least for her injuries. I'm assuming that maybe she went forward with the charges of Oakley due to the warrant being out for his arrest, but at least at first, she didn't want to press any charges against him at all which is very common in domestic assault situations due to the fact that these people are scared of what's going to happen if they really do speak out and these people aren't locked away. But now that Roan was in custody for these charges after the abduction of Colton and Oakley and now the disappearance of Oakley, that is when nobody knew where Madison was. However, Roan's sister would call to inform police that Madison had actually showed up at her door, the person who had called CPS in the first place, asking if she could stay with her. Roan's sister said, you can stay if you tell me what happened to Oakley. And she immediately walked off. 
Her own sister had no idea where she had gone after that. And three days later, the Indianapolis FBI would get involved and the next day a search warrant was issued for the house that Madison Roan and the children allegedly stayed in in Indianapolis. And information about that search has yet to be released. The very next day was March 8th and the investigators were really getting desperate for information. So they asked the public for help. Little two-year-old Oakley Snow is from Cromwell, Oklahoma in Seminole County. Investigators say the last time she was seen was in February. I wouldn't work with this on my worst enemy. I've been on my phone day in, day out, you know what I mean? You know, contacting, trying to find somebody that might know where she's at. If you know anything, just tell us, you know, call the police. We are keeping our hopes alive that she comes home to us safe and sound. They still needed to find Madison as well as Oakley and Roan was not telling them anything about where either person was. The missing persons report claimed that Oakley and Madison could be in Indianapolis and that Oakley had blonde hair, blue eyes, it was about two feet tall and weighed around 35 pounds. Eight days later, another arrest warrant was issued and this time it was for Madison Marshall, the mother. She was being charged with neglect of a dependent, though her whereabouts were still unknown. Seven days later on March 23rd, an anonymous tip led the police to Harnett County, North Carolina, where they would find Madison Marshall. They would detain her, arrest her, and book her into the Harnett County Sheriff's Office with an $80,000 bond. While awaiting extradition, Madison was allegedly questioned several different times and she has yet to reveal Oakley's whereabouts. She is also waiving extradition at this time. With the police department all the way back in Oklahoma, they ended up doing a press conference, which is one of the only news outlets that have covered this. But they had basically gone on there to say that it was not in their jurisdiction to handle this case. And they were saying that all tips should be sent to the Indianapolis police, that basically they couldn't do anything to help. In Seminole County, um, when Madison Marshall left Cromwell with her two children, ages two and seven months, she is a custody mother of these children, and she had committed no crime. And this is kind of an ongoing, off and on deal between her and the father. Um, at that point, we didn't even know that she was gone. Um, after a couple of days, Dad found out. Um, from the sister of Rome Waters, that who's the next boyfriend of Madison, that they had departed Ofushke County and had went to Indianapolis, Indiana. We had no information and nothing that we could issue an Amber Alert. They didn't meet the qualifications. They was with their mother. She is has custody. There's no court orders, um, and there was no proof that they was in danger. Rome was arrested in Colorado in a motel with Madison, and there was no child. Um, he was arrested on an outstanding warrant from Olfusky County that was not connected to this case. Um, and then Madison had hitched a ride back to um, Indianapolis and then from there um, some friends from North Carolina had bought her a bus ticket to go to North Carolina. And we just want the public to know that any information needs to be going to Indianapolis. Um, that's where the charges would be filed at. Um, the social media has got this, all people think that she was seen here and she wasn't. I mean, the last known when she was seen was February the 9th, up there. Um, we have taken voluntary DNA from the father, just in case we need it. Um, but even here, we don't have enough to get a search warrant to get DNA from mother or from Rome because of no crime being committed in this state. And we are in contact with dad. Um, most days, um, investigator Steve Williams talks to him almost on a daily basis. Madison's first court appearance was set for April 4th, and I wasn't able to find much on what occurred at that time, but family and friends of Zachary, of Oakley, of even Madison have been trying to obtain records of what is happening and to give them an insight on what she has said, if she has confessed anything about Oakley that has been found, but as of now, they aren't even said to be told much and the public has been told even less. This could be due to the lack of information in general. It could be due for the, to the ongoing investigation that they don't want to compromise, but the Indianapolis Police Department have kept this case extremely quiet and have really not given the case any updates at all. Roan's sister, Kiana, who was the one who would turn in Roan, 
to CPS would say that the family is all in disbelief. They are devastated. They are confused. And Roan's father, Paul, said that it's not like losing your keys or your damn phone. It's a kid and somebody knows something. So that is something that I have noticed in this case that at least the possible killers, we don't even want to go there yet, but the abductors, the possible abusers, the ones who know where Oakley is, their family, they're not standing up for them. They're really trying to find answers just as much as Zachary and his side of the family. And I do really appreciate seeing that. Now, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children did issue an urgent alert for information, and on April 11th, a candlelight vigil as well as a bake sale occurred for the missing Oakley May Snow. Friends tell me that one of Oakley's favorite things is cookies. Today, they held a bake sale and handed out these flyers. It's been a tough battle trying to get her information out there. I mean, here we are going on three, four months, yeah. and we're just now starting to get attention. You spend night and day thinking about Oakley. I know I wake up and Oakley's on my mind. Anyone know that any information at all, any of the tiniest piece could just help bring her home? Investigators say they're now focusing in on areas in Oklahoma, Indiana, Colorado, and North Carolina. It's exhausting because you just want her home and you want her to know that she's safe. So it's hard. It's heartbreaking. It's exhausting. It's been two months since her disappearance, and so far there has been no information, at least given to the public, and nobody knows what happened to Oakley. Please keep sharing this case. Please keep sharing Oakley's photo. She is only two years old. If you do have information about her whereabouts, please call these numbers on the screen. They will also be listed down below. There's also a wonderful Facebook page that I will link below. Citizens and just online sleuths are doing their best to put together information and to get Oakley's picture shown and to hopefully help find her. They have had millions of hits on the missing persons poster and they are really the only ones that I could find who continually keep talking about this. And Oakley's father, Zachary, also has a cash app that I will leave for you to be able to donate and help with the search if you would like to. I think the most important thing is to keep this story alive and to make sure that the searches are still occurring. Now, I haven't even heard of many searches happening, actually, like ground searches around the area. I believe that one or two may have happened, but there wasn't any conclusive reports that had been made about that. And... I just think because there were so many across state lines, the jurisdiction is an issue and overall it doesn't matter because this two-year-old is missing and everybody needs to be searching. But somebody knows something, even if you just saw the blue Dodge Durango that day being driven somewhere or stopped on the side of the road somewhere, that could mean everything in this case and is so important. But when talking about Oakley's father, Zachary, and the cash app that he is, you know, using, we cannot not talk about the breaking news of the cash app's founder being murdered recently. Robert Harold Lee, who was known as Crazy Bob Lee, was the founder of Cash App and was in the tech industry, was huge in the tech industry, and he was murdered about a week ago from filming this. It was April 4th, 2023, when a 43-year-old Bob would arrive at the Mobile Coin Leadership Conference. And at 2.34 a.m., he was actually calling 911 for help. And he was saying that someone had stabbed him. And when paramedics arrived six minutes later, he was unconscious and bleeding out. There's a male screaming help saying someone stabbed me. He is not giving a 20. This is a cell phone site location. Advise he's bleeding out. Medic, he is outside on the street. He had two stab wounds to the chest. And Bob had been staying at the one hotel. And this was about half a mile away from that hotel. Nobody knew really where he was or what he was doing. And surveillance cameras in the area actually would find Bob had been stumbling around around four minutes before he called 911. He was clutching his stab wounds. He was trying to show people in cars to get help. And in fact, he showed one parked car and they immediately drove away. And then he got out his cell phone and tried to call 911, which he was successful at. 
Now, the Daily Mail was able to obtain this footage and actually released it to the public, or at least some of it. Also on the footage, you could see a man rolling away a suitcase at the same time that Bob was stabbed. However, it's unknown if this has anything to do with the stabbing or if this was just a random bystander, and if so, did they see anything? No answers have been given on that either. Now, Bob would succumb to his injuries soon after arriving at the hospital, and San Francisco Police Chief William Scott announced that it's too early to know if this was just a random attack or a targeted attack. The mayor then asked the public not to, you know, run to conclusions about how this happened and the city and the crime rates because the public was outraged that San Francisco seems to have just a complete increase in crimes lately. So far, no arrests have been made in the murder of Bob Lee, but the mayor has hinted that they have very surprising facts about this case. Just like in Oakley's case, most of this information has been kept private due to the ongoing investigation. There has since been an update in Bob's case since filming. Nine days since the murder, a man was arrested on suspicion of his murder. Nima Momini is the founder of a software company named Expand IT. The police have announced that they actually knew each other, but the motive has not been revealed, though documents have revealed that Nima was angry at Bob due to the fact that Bob was in some kind of relationship with Nima's sister, Kazar, who is a a currently married woman. The day of his murder, police have alleged that Bob arrived at the Millennium Tower, which is where Nima's sister Kazar lived, and then Bob and Nima actually left in the car together, and they were then outside of the car having a conversation that possibly turned into an argument where Nima is thought to have stabbed him to death. But Police have also done many search warrants and have allegedly recovered a bloody knife from Nima's belongings. Nima's sister had also texted Bob shortly after all of this saying, just wanted to make sure you're doing okay because I know Nima came way down hard on you and thank you for being such a classy man and handling it with class. Love you. Nima has been charged with murder and has since appeared in court where he allegedly made a heart with his hands to family in the room who were doing it back to him. The formal arraignment has been scheduled for April 25th, 2023, and Nima's past criminal record states that he was charged with a misdemeanor in 2004 for a DUI and then pled no contest to selling a switchblade in 2011. The police have said that currently Nima is the sole suspect. Bob Lee had two daughters, Dagny and Scout, and his friends said that they were shocked by his murder, that, that he didn't have any enemies that they knew of. Another said they can't imagine a situation where Bob would have instigated a conflict. Another said that Bob's impact will last long beyond his short years on Earth. But I will keep you updated on both the case of Bob Lee and Oakley Snow. And if you have any information in Bob's case, I will also leave the information as far as who to call and where to leave your tips. In both cases, possible witnesses are urged to come forward. The smallest thing matters and could solve these cases that deserve to have an ending. I think in Oakley's case, the fact that her mother has been charged with child neglect, her mother's boyfriend was charged with child abuse, I think it says too much, to be honest. And I'm really hoping that the outcome is not the outcome that we all have probably thought of. But at this point, all we can do is keep searching. I know that there's a hashtag right now, find Oakley Snow, if you'd like to use that in your posts about her. And you know, the fact that she never showed up at a hospital makes me wonder if it was already too late by that point and that they had already done something horrific and that they were just getting rid of the evidence. But just the thought of that makes me want to cry. But yeah, don't forget to speak up. Your voice is powerful enough and I love you to absolute pieces. Okay.